Welcome to Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to resilience, business continuity, emergency management, crisis management, anything that helps you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there. I'm really easy to find, and I do respond to everything I get. Now, every episode I do say, if you'd like to be a guest, reach out. Sometimes there's a little twist for that. I got reached out by a previous guest, Jason Haas, shout out to Jason, who got me in touch with somebody else and said, hey, you should talk to this person. They've got a great story. And I want to welcome that person today. We're going to talk about their own personal journey of resilience. And I'd like to welcome David Gill. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jason, for putting us in contact. Much appreciated. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. I, for the record, I, when we were talking about planning the show uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, we only had 30 minutes and uh, it didn't take long for me to just sit there and basically keep quiet. And I just listened to David. You're like, wow all these things that you started to to tell me about. And I thought, this is going to be an interesting show. And uh, we had to rush in those last uh, five, 10 minutes or so to plan everything because I just kept listening to you. So, <laughs> so we're going to hopefully uh, touch on some of that and probably get a little bit more insight on a few things. Um, and some of the things you have to say are uh, really interesting. But let's, let's say, uh, you know, th th I know some of the things you're probably going to say and they're really interesting. I'm looking forward to it. But I know you and I had that chat of getting to know each other a bit. Can you take a, a minute or two just to introduce yourself and tell us what you do and how you got into what you do? And then we'll get into your own personal journey. Yeah, certainly. Uh, my name is David Gill. Uh, I'm originally a Brit or a Cornishman, now living in New York. And uh, I've been running a logistics company up here for about the last seven months. But now looking at getting back into sort of like the old career and uh, looking at some different steps. So it's uh, been, been an interesting time getting to know New York and uh, yeah, very much looking forward to the next steps and meeting people yeah. within the resilience of network. Hey, yeah, there's lots of us here. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I've lot. certainly <laughs> noticed that. And it's a very friendly and very sort of uh, supportive community. So very grateful for the connections I've been making so far. So oh, very, great. very interesting. That's good to hear. Uh, you know, we are in that industry where yeah. we have to support each other because we're supporting our our co-workers, we're supporting our leadership, we're supporting our organizations and communities. So, you know, who are we if we can't even support each other? No, I agree. And uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly a varied, varied industry. So I'm looking forward to sort of uh, the, how the journey continues in it. Well, so, great. Yeah. Well, speaking of journey... That's what we're going to be talking about today is your journey of resilience, because there are some very interesting things to, to bring forward. So I want to ask, ask you right off the bat, how did your resilience journey get started or where did it start? Um, crumbs, probably, I'd say sort of uh, by the end of my teenage years, uh, I'd been... Uh, grew up in a military family back in the UK, so I was always out of weekends with the air cadets rucksacks on back, uh, yomping across the moors of, Dar uh, of Dartmoor, navigating through horrible weather conditions with basically all the, all the stuff that we could carry. And uh, I was due to go off to university and I was selected by my local Rotary Club to do a Ro Rotary Youth Leadership Award. And from that sort of point onwards, the uh, sort of motto of uh, Rotary is service above self. And with that military background, I was always sort of thinking of where I'd want my career to go. Um, I wanted to become a, an expedition leader. And so I thought I've got to build up my credibility. I'm, I'm, I'm an 18 year old. What, what do I need to do? So I looked at degrees and was due to go and read history. And I changed it at the last minute following that rotary course to go and read uh, outdoor education. So I flipped uh, college degrees literally two weeks before I was due to start and I thought right I want to go into the military and I considered the Royal Air Force so my father was in the Air Force for 30 odd years so I grew up around that that community 
And I always kind of knew I wanted to to have some adventures. I'd listen to his stories about his service in the Middle East, out in Africa, out in the Far East. My uncle was in the Merchant Navy. So we grew up in a household surrounded by all these objects that had been collected from their travels. And I just went, right, got to build this credibility. And uh, say, so teenage years, I learned how to fly a glider before I could even learn how to drive. Uh, I did a pilot navigation course with the Air Force. And then went for selection, thought, right, you're going to become a fighter pilot. Every boy's dream, they want to become Tom Cruise. Uh, unfortunately, the RAF and my aptitude had a slight disagreement. They turned around and said, but I was never going to be a pilot. So that was my sort of first flip. It's like the career that I spent my teenage years dreaming about, over. So I applied to the Army. I thought, if I can't fly planes, I'm going to learn a different set of skills. So I went through various regiments, interviews with tank regiments, cavalry, infantry. And then I settled with the, not didn't settle, but was accepted into the Royal Artillery. So I geared up to go off to Sandhurst. I thought, right, six years, brilliant. I'll come out of that and I'll be an expedition leader. I've got my mountain leader's qualification. All of this, I can then look clients and parents in the eyes and say, I'm going to take your kids off to Africa, off to South America, and I'm going to bring them back safely uh but again life happened and shortly before i was due to go to sandhurst i dislocated a knee in a sailing accident and that was a complete sort of game changer i'm just sat there now with a leg in plaster three months away from going off to the military and uh so <laughs> i then forced through physio um i damaged my knee even more by just cutting off a plaster and just going, right, I'm going to make this. I've got to get through these physicals. I want to go off. I want to become an army officer. And uh, well, so, when, <laughs> as sorry, so you, you did that just to try, to try and get yourself to make the schedule and to, to get to the military, right? Yes. That's why you cut it off and did that. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So uh, <clears throat> I, I sort of said, went through physios then had to go for a medical board and I literally stood there I left my crutches at the uh the doors to the, this medical director in Harley Street in London limped up his steps stood there as he pulled my leg around and he could see that I was in pain he knew that I, <laughs> but I was just determined and uh literally as I got got into Sandhurst and within a couple of weeks my knee was shot so I'm just sat there just going what do I do uh, my company commander gave me the option of doing this thing called premature voluntary release, which meant I could go back. If I, if I pulled out medically, I could go back again. So I thought, right, it's it's not game over, but it's certainly on pause at the moment. So limped home and I started going, right, how do I get this knee strong? How do I get my fitness up? And so I applied to Outward Bound Wales. And I think, Outward Bound now has 35 schools across the world, but the original sea center is in Abu Dhabi in Wales. And uh, to teach by Kurt Hahn, uh, an educationalist, and uh, guy surnames Holt from Blue Line sort of uh, merchant sort of fleet. And they were finding that the Atlantic convoys were getting attacked by German U boats, and all these sailors are going down. and they didn't have that resilience. They didn't have that uh, strength of character to, to try and get through those survival situations. So fast forward 60 years. So, and I'm now working for Outward Bound. And again, they've got a beautiful sort of uh, philosophy. And I've just got it written down here. And it says, we are better than we know. If only we can be brought to realize this. We never, we may never again, uh, uh, never again be prepared to settle for anything less. And I'm sat there, I'm taking students out onto the hills, preparing them for sort of like uh, the unknown. They're coming from inner cities, the first time sort of out in the countryside. We're preparing them, teaching them how to climb, how to pack the bags and just get out into the outdoors. But at the same time, it was instilling into me that if you have sort of setbacks, you can pivot, you can change. Nothing is guaranteed. And I had a wonderful time there. Um, but yet, still in the back of my head, I've got this nagging feeling about 
leading expeditions. So I was offered a position with another company to go to South America and take a group of 20 university graduates across Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and Bolivia, uh, which is phenomenal. And I literally bit my hands off, packed a rucksack, and plodded off to uh, into Quito. And I couldn't speak a word of Spanish, had never been there before. <laughs> so I parachuted into this environment with a Lonely Planet phrase book. Uh, I, and if anybody is going traveling, the Lonely Planet phrase books are absolutely phenomenal. They'll get you through anywhere. I, I've used them in many situations with different languages. And uh, again, sort of, it, that was my introduction to sort of real sort of traveling. Um, we had set, not set itineraries. We had to be in certain places by certain days, but it was up to us. I had fiscal responsibility for 20 people. I had a mental and physical well being to look after. Um, the whole works. So we went through environments from cities through to climbing Cotopaxi uh, down into the Amazon basin. And so, yeah, to Machu Picchu, uh, to the Atacama Desert. So, I, as I said, I can believe I'm being paid to take people traveling. I'm being paid to be a, an explorer, so to speak. And it got me hooked. And I, I, I was always conscious that I had this place back at Sandhurst. I had my obligation to the army. And uh, that overwhelming sense of this service, that I, what, this journey that I wanted to go on. Uh, but then I got offered it a expedition to Africa and again sort of like all the great explorers all learning the history of cultures and languages of Africa as a child it was just phenomenal so I remember sort of like landing in Malawi with another group of high school girls and the smell of rain on the asphalt the red you could probably see the picture behind me the red sort of like soil of Africa just was intoxicating and I knew then that Africa was a place I wanted to spend a lot more time. Um, so, yeah, after that month, came back. Armies are now set for January, February time of the following year. And this is September, October time. So I, I poodled around. I did some uh, temping work. And then picked up another expedition. So it was another phone call to the army and just saying, look, can we delay the January intake? Uh, I'm off to Belize for three or four months to to lead a jungle expedition, uh, to go and map my ruins. It was, again, another Indiana Jones moment. Uh, we sat there in the middle of northern Belize. We had to go use uh, canoes to get across the lagoon to then get to this pristine jungle uh, and map a square mile. So we're hacking our way through with machetes, transect lines, recording every stone every object that didn't look natural and we slowly built up this map and we found i think it was about 250 potential buildings we found an old temple and on the face of this there's you can actually see there's a there's a mayan face i'm just sat there just going i go into this go into this tomb what the heck is this all about a phenomenal expedition and again uh we're having to look after the 20, 20 clients, teaching them the, the pitfalls of living in a jungle, the whole health and hygiene side of things, as well as foot picking after your feet, the whole sort of shebang. And I came home from Belize with a hole in my arm. I, I ended up with leishmaniasis to a point where my, my flesh was just rotting off in there. Oh. Bot flies in the back of my shoulder. But it was, I, I viewed those as part of my scars, part of earning the, <laughs> earning my spurs kind of thing. And during this, during this whole time, again, the army is sat there. Uh, and I had basically forgotten when I was in the jungle that I had sent off my resume to this organization, the Halo Trust, which is a British nonprofit that uh, clears landmines. And at the time it was a, uh, set up in the 1980s in, in Afghanistan to address the problem of refugees coming back after the war and uh, getting blown up. Then it was removing the obstacles to allow aid convoys in to release the land. And I'm just sat there just going, this sounds great. 
this is definitely something that I wouldn't get into at this stage. Uh, I, I, I thought about, I need to get the army. It was all ex-army guys running the organization. And I got an invite up for a, for an interview. I uh, left Cornwall, traveled up to Scotland, and just thought, if anything, it's going to be interesting. Uh, went through this grueling interview board with four desk officers and the, uh, uh, the, the sort of like founding director of the company, uh, of the charity. And uh, it got to the end. I sat in, I think, on um, during that interview process, there was four other guys with me, all ex army officers. There's a para, there's infantry guys. There's, and I just went, right, they're going to hire them. And so went home, not expecting to hear anything. Uh, a few days later, I get a phone call just going, you, you said your your availability was you could fly out in a week. And it's like, yeah. Next thing I know, there's a ticket to Yerevan. I'm off to go and learn how to clear lands. And I'm just sat there trying to explain this to my parents. So I think I'd sold them on the idea of going to the army. I'd sold them on the idea of that. And then I turned around and said, I'm, it looks like I'm skipping part of a, my projected career. I'm, I'm ending up working in these environments, removing uh, these obstacles, these things that are destroying people's lives. And it was like, okay. And I'm just sat there. They asked me, uh, hey, I sort of got, got any questions. It's like, yeah, wh where is Nagorno-Karabakh? So I put, promptly pulled out a map and it's uh, in the Caucasus regions. Uh, an Armenian enclave within Azerbaijan, just north of Iran, uh, an absolute amazing country or area, full of history, full of some like uh, legacies of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so I'm there in my mid twenties or early twenties, just going, okay, this is going to be an interesting sort like journey. And so yeah, flew out to Yerevan, and then big four-ton van, uh, truck, driven through the Lachin Corridor, which is a tiny little road uh, that attached Armenia to uh, the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh through Azerbaijan territory. And I'm just sitting there just going, what am I doing? What the heck is <laughs> going on here? And I uh, got to Stepanika, uh, a very uneasy sort of night's sleep, met the program manager who was going to do my training, met the teams and then the next day um literally put on body armor and was taken to a minefield and i'm just sat there just going how have i ended up here what <laughs> what is going on this is this is quite scary stuff yeah. and uh so they, they have safe air safe safe lane so basically was given a minefield briefing and then taken walk through safe areas within a minefield and then, so the first time I saw a mine, it was, uh, what was it, a PMN2, which is a, a Soviet anti-personnel mine. And these things are about the size, uh, about, imagine, so like slightly bigger than a tin of tuna, just lying there on the ground, this green, ne ne neon, not quite neon green, but this off green plastic thing with a black pressure cloud on it. And I'm just sat there going, right, this is now my career. This is now what I'm going to be learning how to do. And so over the next sort of like three months or so, uh, we ran through a training program about how to clear landmines. So down on your hands and knees with detectors, learn, moving forwards in a very methodical sort of way, uh, going forwards 15 centimetres at a time, three times sweeping it over in a one metre wide lane. You move your barrier forwards and you investigate every metal signal. It's laborious. It is hard work. You're exposed to the environment, uh, the weather conditions. And you're looking for something that could potentially blow you up. So I'm just sat there just going, brilliant. This is a rewarding sort of uh, <laughs> career, but also slightly bonkers in a way. <laughs> and uh, from there, I was then from... From the landmines was taught how to do surveys of areas so if you've got a suspect area where there's been accidents or where farmers are fear to sort of like use their plows or uh, plant crops or children are scared to go into along pathways to get to schools and you're removing these barriers because once a landmine's gone it's gone 
it's not going to ever repeat itself. So you're knowing that that land is being given back to, to a community and knowing that the, that community can rebuild and then life can, can carry on. So it was an incredibly rewarding sort of experience. Uh, we're thrown into learning about uh, fleet management. So working out or learning how to fix vehicles, how to manage your stores and the logistics of things. Finance, dealing with donors, uh, dealing with budgets, dealing with HR. So it's absolutely incredible training package. Uh, it so just sets you up. It's kind of like a the resilience or business continuity professional. You've got a whole pile of different stakeholders you have to manage. Yes. Including, oh, yes. The, including the people that you know, want to go to school, the kids that want to go to school. They're one of your stakeholders. Yes. So, so you've got the, the local community. You've got the local authorities that you have to deal with as well. Uh, and then you've got the donor community. You've got the, the countries, the fund foundations that are actually paying for this work. So there's a lot of reporting. There's a lot of diplomacy. There's a lot of allocating the right resources and kind of things, uh, to give them that, that bang for their buck. So there's a lot of sort of things that need to be sort of analysed. And then you say the strategic planning, working out how long a task will take, the square metres of the areas, that whole sort of thing. So it's an incredible uh, package of training that they gave. And from that, they, they let me loose. Um, so my first deployment was to uh, Abkhazia, a separatist region of Georgia. So again, a great man of the Soviet Union saw a lot of ethnic tension, a lot of uh, problems that Stalin and Beria and everybody had created back in the 1930s, all the way through, it was suddenly now back at the forefront. Nationalism, you've got uh, areas like South Ossetia, Chechnya, all going for independence. Every sort of uh, country or republic within the Soviet Union is now broken away. And then within that, you've got these the, these ethnic tensions that are being forced upon people to suddenly go their separate way. So, so I was posted to Gali, which is, uh, it was an ethnic Mingrelian or Georgian area. And during the, the 1991 war, I think it was, uh, those, the, the Georgian population were forced out of the area. And we're slowly coming back as refugees trying to pick up their lives and trying to pick up where their houses, their farms. And to throw into the mix, the UN are there. So we had a UN observer mission and then Russian peacekeepers. So again, when you sort of say stakeholders, you've got all of these factors built into it. Plus then divisions between national staff who only a few years earlier have been on opposite sides of, of this conflict. And are now sort of like united in this uh, desire to get rid of these landmines. But at the same time, you just sat there trying to balance teams. It, it, it was absolutely incredible. I would say great responsibility. Um, and it, on, again, on in that, a stunning region. As well. We're going to take a break now because I know there's still more to come. Uh, yeah. Interesting stories because I know a couple that you mentioned the other day I'm waiting to hear. So mm -hmm. we're taking a break. We're talking about uh, person's uh, journey of discovery and resilience with David Gill, and we will be right back. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody. <laughs> 